When I looked at those 138 zeros, I said this is better than our confirmation of the second law of thermodynamics. As a physicist in the audience can tell you, there's about one chance in 10 to the 80th that you can get heat flowing from uh, cold bodies to hot bodies rather than hot bodies to cold bodies. And if you think about that in a little bit, it could scare you. I mean, some of you have glasses here with ice in it. You know, the air molecules in this room are all different temperatures. Some of them are above the freezing point of water, some of them are below the freezing point of water. Not very many, but a few. There's a finite possibility that all the air molecules in this room that are below the freezing point of water could migrate in the vicinity of where you're sitting right now and freeze you to death. And if you care to work it out, it's less than one chance in 10 to the 80th that will happen. Well, none of us wakes up in the morning worrying about a reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. That possibility is so tiny, we don't really give it a whole lot of concern. But what I recognize as a 19-year-old, I demonstrated just based on 13 statements in this book, let alone the 3,500, that this is 10 to the 38, 58 times more reliable than the second law of thermodynamics. And since I gambled my life on the second law of thermodynamics every day, every second, uh, the only rational response I felt was to make a similar commitment based on the message of this book. Now, I must give credit to the Gideons. They tell you exactly what you have to do at the end of every one of their little Bibles. And they give you a place to sign your name and to date it. They don't let you off the hook. And so I went through those two pages where they point out that you're not perfect. And I says, yep, I can understand that. I'm not perfect. But the thing that really got to me is that they stated that it was impossible to gain perfection. And the harder you try, the more you're going to recognize that. And I says, that's me. Because ever since I was 17, I was doing everything I could to lead a moral life. And the harder I tried, the more miserable I felt. And the Gideons pointed out that that's simply evidence that God's standard of morality is perfection. And he gave us his conscience so we would realize what that standard was and realize our hopelessness in meeting that standard. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for imperfection, so that if we choose, uh, we can gain that freedom from the penalty of our sin. Sounded like a good deal to me, so I signed my name, I dated it, and began to tell people at the University of British Columbia uh, what had been going on in my life the past two years and why I had come to this conclusion. And I did have a few occasions to talk to my fellow students and professors about the Christian faith and to persuade some. But when I came to Caltech, I found there were Christians everywhere. That place was loaded with Christians uh, at all levels, faculty, graduate students, undergraduate support staff. And that eventually led me to take up a position uh, at a church and uh, just eight years ago to establish an organization, Reasons to Believe, uh, where we function as a small group of scientists that study the frontiers of scientific endeavor uh, to discover new tools to convince people that indeed the God of the Bible created the universe. And if you want to keep up to date, we put out a free newsletter about these recent scientific discoveries that add to the weight of evidence for the God of the Bible. They told me to end at 1225. That's the time now. Uh, I'd like to entertain any questions or comments that you would have on any issues pertaining to science, uh, faith, and the Bible. Before we uh, take some questions for uh, comments, uh, Dr. Ross, um, you have on your tables a um, <coughs> back frame. Yeah. I have a question about uh, somewhere in the Old Testament it talks about the sun standing still. Mm -hmm. Okay, the question had to do about the text in Joshua that talks about the sun standing si still. Okay, it's written in Hebrew. The whole Old Testament, except for a couple of chapters of Daniel, is written in Hebrew. And if you check the Hebrew uh, structure of that sentence, it could be an extended period of darkness or an extended period of light that adds up to about 24 hours. So you can't tell from the text whether Joshua needed it to be dark and cool or bright so that he could see. So it could go either way. Uh, the other thing you pick up on is that this may be a phenomena that was isolated just to the valley where the battle was taking place. 
and my wife and I have been to the actual location, and you've got a ring of hills surrounding the battlefield. So it's possible that that happened through a local uh, atmospheric disturbance, you know, such as a heavy cloud layer coming down so it would be extra dark in that valley and cool so that the soldiers could keep on fighting, or you could imagine some uh, strange atmospheric effect where you get a lot of extra light refracted or reflected in. Uh, so that would be possible. It would also be possible that it's an outright miracle from beyond matter, energy, length, width, height, and time. Uh, some Bible interpreters have suggested the Shekinah glory of God himself in the spiritual realm was responsible for that extra light. So there's two ways you can look at it. Uh, a local natural phenomena taking place with supernatural timing uh, or an outright uh, miraculous event from beyond space and time. What might be more interesting is uh, Hezekiah's sundial <coughs> uh, in the book of Isaiah in Second Chronicles. Because there it speaks about a similar event where the shadow of the sun went back 40 minutes on the sundial. And this time it was witnessed not just in one place, but in two places, Jerusalem and Babylon. And so that virtually eliminates the possibility of some local atmospheric uh, explanation. There I think you'd have to appeal to an outright miracle from beyond space and time. Uh, but by the way, it's a simple rumor that JPL scientists have confirmed the event. They have not. And JPL has asked me to do what I can to refute that rumor. But it's running around the Christian community for the past 25 years. Uh, there is no confirmation from JPL or NASA that this event actually took place, but neither is there any confirmation that it did not take place. You can't argue one way or the other based on the science. Yes? Okay, the question was, what about the wise men and the star of Bethlehem? Uh, we have a three-page handout. It's free, so if you contact us, you'll get all the details on it. Uh, but let me be quick about it. Um, number one, there's probably more than three wise men. Uh, the text doesn't tell you how many, but it was a large enough entourage that have put the whole city of Jerusalem into an uproar. So I think it was quite a large contingent of wise men from the east. The other thing we note is they did not know the location of this event. They only knew the time. The reason they went to Jerusalem was to inquire of the Hebrew scholars there to find the location of this uh, new king. But they did know the time. And you say, how come they knew the time and the Jewish scholars didn't? Well, there's only one passage in the Old Testament that predicts the coming of the Messiah, the timing of the coming of the Messiah, and that's Daniel chapter 9. And if you read the book of Daniel, Daniel was one of the wise men from the east. And because you know, he was a contemporary of the wise men, we would expect that the wise men in the east would be familiar with the prophecy of Daniel. So they knew the approximate time, because Daniel kind of roughed it out to about the approximate year in which the Messiah would arrive. And so at that time, they'd be looking for a sign. Now, it couldn't have been an extremely dramatic sign because it would have been recorded everywhere. And it couldn't be an extremely undramatic